two things. I, um, I think I'm the only person here from the South Pacific, so I can almost tell you anything. <laughs> but, um, and one of the, I'll do two things in this talk. One is to introduce you to where I come from, which is um, in the South Pacific, and I'm not sure if any of you have been there. But the second is that my background is in traditional knowledge, and, and my upbringing is in traditional knowledge through being Māori. So my work is not in using science to validate knowledge, but it's using traditional knowledge to understand the relationship between what we know over generations as against what people are trying to learn in science processes. So it's a little bit of the other direction, if you like. So, and it interests me to know just how qualified our information was as Māori, as people that have progressed through the Pacific you know, over generations, um, compared to how commercial systems are starting to address some of our crops. So we did a very simple experiment which looked at um, a comparison of, of Māori knowledge against commercial systems for kumara. And kumara is sweet potato. Everywhere in the Pacific you'll hear a variation of the name kumala, kumara, but um, it's a sweet potato in English. And um, it's one of those crops that's moved with people. So it's come through the migrations, and we know as Māori that our history goes right back to the mythological times and Kumara belongs with the people right through that, uh, that period. So we're going to look at the establishment methods that are applied both traditionally and um, in a commercial system. So just a little bit of background. We call New Zealand Aotearoa. So um, that's the language, and that's the language I was brought up with. So it's both, but internationally it's New Zealand, it's obviously the South West Pacific. I'll come over here a bit. And Māori are the indigenous people. New Zealand was the last uh, major landmass to be colonised, and that's in about 1840. There was contact, of course, before that time with sealers and whalers. There now is a population of about 4 million people, and that's across three main islands but a number of small islands as well. Half of that population live in the very top, sort of one-eighth of the North Island, which is the subtropical region, if you like. The rest of us live elsewhere. Um, it's a temperate to a sub-Antarctic climate, so that's a really broad range of climate zones. The talk just about orca, we grow that as a, as a major crop, and we don't grow it at altitude, it's grown at sea level. A capricious climate, it's just a word I like to use, but we our climate is influenced by the ocean. Like it or not, we don't have two days the same. We, we can't predict our climate um, week by week because the ocean has so much effect on it. And right now with the El Nino, La Nina sort of um, complex, we're going through some major sort of climate change um, issues. And we do also have what I call the variable landscape and soils. You can live in the part of the country where I live that every an area like this may have two soil types in it, simply because of the geology of the, the, um, the country and the formation. Those pictures down the bottom are sort of just showcasing this is what we call a marae. This is where I come from. So traditional sort of houses that we use for meetings, etc. And this is how we see the world. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that this is our interpretation of, of our place in the world. So we are, in mythology, we believe this island here to be the waka, the canoe, and the North Island, which sits beneath it, is the fish. And that, that's how we see the world. So literally, this is how we see the world. So it's a challenge right from the beginning about how science interacts with us. <laughs> and with our thing. So that's putting that in that perspective. So society for, for us prior to colonisation is, is quite different. Māori cultural lifestyle is very much a subsistence and a seasonal basis. We live in a zone that has very definitive seasons, that when it comes out of summer, we move into a very sort of wet winter, and everything that happens is based on a seasonal sort of progression. The knowledge was retained orally, so there is no written language and it's retained in the arts as well. So the arts, I'm talking about carving, I'm talking about song, and whakatauki, which is our um, problems. 
very much a spiritual relationship and that, that's standard across all of the uh, South Pacific cultures. Plant-focused systems, we had no mammals prior to European colonisation. Everything was fish and bird based for protein. There were what's called a Polynesian rat, the kiore, but it didn't um, populate the same as your, your ship rats, so they weren't uh, that common. So there was no animal farming. Everything in pre-European times was based on a system that was plant-focused. To harvest your protein was just, you went out as required and harvested from the bush or from the ocean. Putting that in perspective, very minor pest and disease issues. You didn't have um, the, the current issues around biosecurity and bio, you know, biological issues, pests and diseases. But one of the most important factors for us was the storage of crops. Remember, it's a, it's a seasonal system. We couldn't grow kumara as an example for 12 months of the year, which you can do in the tropics. So everything was based on the ability to store. You could produce the crop quite easily, but your success as a community was based on that ability to store. The protein, as I mentioned, was the fish and the birds. And the lifestyle was based on a transient movement between um, sites to harvest and to um, for security and that sort of thing. Our land management practices, which is what we'll talk about shortly, and a, a very strong emphasis on Ronga Māori, which is traditional medicines, is one of the things that has progressed right through to the current day. So again, just another view to show off, I guess. This is um, another, what we call a, a marae meeting house. So this is, these are the areas where we as communities come together, but also where the product of our systems comes to be the, the uptake, you know, the food we grow. As you guys see, the small house in the middle is the meeting house, the one on the left will be the dining hall, and very much a communal lifestyle, a communal um, system, if you like. So, what is Māori horticulture and what makes it different to horticulture anywhere else in the world? And the reality for us is that it's a complex between tropical and temperate horticulture, if you like. We have lots of stories, lots of memory about crops in the old days, the, the oti, the mulberry, which is what they make tapa cloth out of. Um, yams, I've just heard something about them this morning, and one we call kuru, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the breadfruit. We have a number of crops that are pre-European, so they're either endemic or exotic. Some of them come with the people, but the hue, the kumara, taro, the tikoka, which is a very unique South Pacific um, cordyline species. The parafern, the puha, which is most people would know as the south thistle, which is one of the key green vegetables that we eat. Kokihi, another crop that is, um, is internationally grown, but it's actually not grown much in New Zealand for commercial purposes. And the harakiki flax. And of course, since European contact, we have the Indian corn, the taiwa, and uh, hokina and komkom, which are cucurbits, and a whole lot of other crops. So it's a real combination of um, systems. And here's some visuals just to give you a little bit of a start to our cropping systems, if you like. So the two pictures on the left are taken, drawn some time ago, but they're visuals of how they used to undertake cropping, very much a almost a Neolithic sort of um, production system because prior to European colonisation there were no metal tools of course. And our systems of production, this is one taken a year ago um, in one of our projects, we're still very much the same, we, we changed the tools of course, but the whole system of um, plant material, layout and management of the crops still happens to be the same. So what is the kumara? This is the, the crop we're talking about. Most people will know the sweet potato, kuas kumara, and in origin of course. It's subtropical and perennial in that climate zone, but for us remember it's uh, mostly in the temperate climate zone, so it's grown as an annual. In New Zealand the kumara doesn't flower, so it doesn't achieve that full life cycle that's, that's climatically where it is. So we have to grow that crop by vegetative means. And our tukuna, our ancestors, if you like, 
had to teach themselves coming from a tropical region into a temperate region how to do that. So they had to rework the horticultural knowledge to ensure that this crop could be carried through. It is a harvested root that's, um, that's a swollen root, sorry, that's harvested, and in, in New Zealand it takes a minimum of five months to reach that harvest period. A bit of the old and new, but we, we lay them in beds, we call them tapapa, and those beds are laid out about six weeks before the crop is, the cuttings are needed, and um, we keep, it's what we call, it's the hokapapa of the crop, the hokapapa is the genealogy of the crop, and we keep the very best kumara from the previous year to carry over those characteristics to the next year. It's a bit like people. If you maintain the best qualities generationally, they will carry through. We do it with the crops. So we keep the best, we eat the worst. And we always eat the damaged first, and all of that, so there's a whole hierarchy of how crops are managed. So the best are held over, they're carried through to grow cuttings, and those cuttings get planted out into the field. This is one of our trials. So you'll see just across here several different varieties. You can see them visually with the different sort of leaf shapes and what have you. And ultimately they should harvest like this. So this is one just harvested about three, four weeks ago. So what we did in a very simple terms was look at the difference between our traditional method of establishment compared to the contemporary uh, commercial methods that are applied. So traditionally we base everything on, on mātauranga, so that's that knowledge that's handed down generationally. We base it on an annual production system, and that production system primarily is based on a sustainable opportunity because remember our land form is quite variable and the good cropping land is not huge, so you have to move around sites to get um, adequate for the cropping year by year. But working on a rotation in some areas of, of up to 50 years. For us, we took rooted cuttings, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but um, so we allowed those beds to grow on and we took rooted cuttings from those beds which were then taken out, put into a mud slurry and then taken out and planted in the, um, in the garden. Some very strict planting criteria. One of the things about cultural systems is that it relies very heavily on spiritual associations to ensure the success of that crop, if you like. So some very clear, definitive planting processes. And one is that it had to be planted facing to the rising sun, and that's that early morning warmth on the plant, if you sort of interpret that. And another is that only certain people could do certain activities, so um, women who hadn't had their family were not allowed to do activities that carried, included lifting products, all those sorts of things. So lots of criteria around how it was planted, and we still adhere to those, those ways in the, in the current time. In a contemporary system, of course everything is, is sort of refined through research and we expect that. And in New Zealand, the commercial growers are very narrowly focused. The one area of the country and it's a very high, um, high input system that is, supplies the whole country in some export. So they have lots of, well from their point of view, lots of contemporary pressures around pest and diseases because their returns, of course, have to be better. They use what non-rooted cuttings for planting and a mechanised planting process and they support all of that. We support ours with karakia, with prayers and everything else. They support theirs with chemicals and, and all of those things. And that's been a little bit flippant, but it is the difference about how the people see what's required to get that plant through to a harvest um, situation. So to produce some vegetatively, those beds laid out, as I mentioned, and in about six to eight weeks, you take the cuttings off, off the beds, and that depends on, on the temperature coming out of the winter. So those beds are laid out at the end of the winter. They were pulled, and a portion of the parent kumara was taken with the plant in very traditional times, so that it carried a piece of that, that earlier generation, if you like, across. And in more recent times, we pull them with roots already formed so that they're ready to go. In contemporary times, or in the commercial systems, there's no roots at all. 
So there's an example of the tree on the left. This is a contemporary the cutting, just taken off those beads. The one in the middle, the rooted cutting, and the one on the end with a piece of the tuber. A bit closer to see that. And you'll see they should have a minimum of three leaves, which they do. Here's a piece of the, the root. But more recently, we moved to this system here, where we pull them once they've grown a few small rootlets to get started. So the cutting, this would be taken and they would strip off those bottom leaves because they become uh, superfluous. But it's purely cut from the beds, and they're all cut at the same length and the same height. The issues, of course, for modern systems are that there's new pests and diseases, and like it or not, um, we have to respond to them. So, so the commercial systems are the, are the first to sort of try their ways of responding to them. One of the biggest problems is a skin disease called black scurf. And that skin disease is cosmetic, so it affects the marketability of the crop as against the quality of the flesh itself. But in a commercial system, that marketability is what matters first. And of course, the other major issue with kumara is the rots in storage. So as against potatoes, which tend to have a very easy storage program, kumara have a relatively easy production and are quite um, got a few issues around storage. We have weed issues and we have climate issues. And our big push now is, is the climate effect, especially on our country, because the the most recent research indicates that the traditional systems will have to move south because of the effect of climate. The, um, the change of rainfall, the change of temperature, all of those things are impacting on systems and soil events. So we did some very simple trials. We laid out those beds, we took cuttings at six weeks and we grew them on in pots for 30 days. And then we took a series of uh, measurements just to assess the two systems, fresh and dry shooting root weights, um, the ratio, shoot to root ratio, leaf year, leaf count, and apply the full analysis, which you do in the university system, of course. And these are the, the very preliminary results. And of interest to us is that it, it really indicates that the traditional approach in that establishment phase, and I'm not talking right through to harvest or anything, I'm just talking in the, the first three weeks for establishment, um, gave much better results. And if you look at that, there's quite a big difference across all those categories in the results. So, what we take out of that is that in all of the, the ways we looked at those two systems, it indicated that our traditional knowledge had value. That traditional knowledge had been learned over generations and that it had taught us the best way to establish the crop um, and get the to have a successful end result is to have a successful establishment of that crop in the beginning. The, um, the shoot to root ratio in the early stages, it's a positive factor to have that uh, relatively low. But of key interest is that leaf area, which is the productive part of the plant, so understanding just how well we could get that, those plants into early um, establishment. In Māori systems, we don't irrigate crops. So we, when they're planted, they get a drink, and that's it. You walk away and you do the next task, the next task, but you don't irrigate. And if a plant doesn't survive, then in a Māori mindset, it was never meant to. So you move on. But we don't irrigate crops, but we come from a climate that has regular rainfall, so we're not, we don't generally have drought systems, having said that the last few years we have. Um, but for us, and this starts the conversation, and we'll do some more work on it, obviously, over the next few years, but it helps to validate where that traditional knowledge is sort of coming from relative to this crop. There are, of course, other issues that we need to take into account, and most certainly, if those crops are to be marketed as against just used um, locally, then we need to be more cognizant of that. But, also of key interest to us is the ability of understanding the different establishment systems to respond to climate change in the future. So I think that's me for the moment. Kia ora. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If you'll have time to ask your questions, 
later, but we could have 